Hi, um, welcome to this talk. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, something that I'm really enthusiastic or interested in, um, which is this sort of like tension between the real world and our efforts to model it or to try to make sense of it, if you like. Um, and I will be talking a lot about um, sort of a basic tool that we need uh, when we try to model parts of the world or to try to make sense of the world in some sense, which is categorization, because we do need, uh, when we have this uh, experience of the world, we need to sort of group things together uh, and to try to make sense of it. A um, few words about me, uh, very few words. Uh, I, my name is Anna Höst, I'm a Norwegian software developer. I have been uh, making software, working in the software industry uh, for about 20 years now. I work for the Norwegian Labor and Welfare Administration, uh, which is a fairly large organization by Norwegian standards. We administer a lot of money, uh, about a third of the national budget in Norway, and we use that money to provide services to the Norwegian public, such as uh, unemployment, uh, unemployment benefits, uh, sickness benefits, pensions, childcare, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and we have a lot of different categories in place to determine sort of who qualifies for what services under what circumstances. But basically, from the moment that you're born as a Norwegian citizen, uh, and until at some later point in time, sort of the inverse happens, uh, we have services available uh, to help you if you need them. And in a sense, this talk is going to be a talk about category theory, but not in the sort of uh, mathematical functional programming sense. Um, it's more about theories about how these categories that we apply to make sense of the world, how they sort of work. And George Lakoff says that there is this um, folk theory of categories, and a folk theory is something that is unarticulated, but we sort of believe in. So we, we have a notion in our heads of how, how things work, and that's the folk theory. And he says that this folk theory of categories has three tenets, three parts to it. One is that things come in well-defined categories, which means it's sort of easy to put a thing into its right category. Um, these categories are ca uh, characterized by shared and necessary properties. So if you have the right properties, you, you sort of um, know what category that thing belongs to. And the third one is that there is one right taxonomy of the categories, and sort of our job is to uncover what those are, in a sense, and then, then we'll have arrived at a good categorization. The problem with the folk theory of categorization is that these are all wrong. Uh, and, and that's sort of, uh, the rest of the talk is going to be about uh, the details of how that, those, those tenets are wrong, in a sense. So none of this stuff holds. Um, in addition to category theory, we'll be looking a lot at um, different examples of category practice, which is perhaps the most interesting part. Uh, what happens when we try to impose categories on the real world and the way the real world tends to respond by not respecting those very much. But okay, um, so here we are. Uh, I, need some, I need some way to sort of introduce this topic to you. Uh, so I thought, uh, this is what I came up with, I thought it would be nice to start with a greeting. Uh, and the best way to start a greeting is by saying hello, right? So we're off to a good start by saying hello to a greeting. Um, and then even better, perhaps, is to say something like fellow, because now I'm establishing some, establishing some common ground and some, some equality between uh, you and I. But then uh, we come sort of to, to the category. Uh, and for that, I wanted to strike sort of a dissonant chord at the piano. Um, to create some sort of reaction. So I, I landed at this, hello fellow apes. <laughs> and what I'm going for is some sort of reaction to that statement. I'm sort of interested in the neurons that are now firing in your brains uh, when you encounter this word. I could have chosen a lot of other categories, obviously. Uh, perhaps something, I could have said something like, hello fellow humans. And it sounds a little bit stilted. So like uh, something like Mark Zuckerberg could say to sort of try to blend in with the crowd. Um, <laughs> but it's perfectly acceptable, right? I could have said something like, hello, fellow sentient beings, which is a bit odd, uh, but presumably not as dissonant as the one I chose. 
Uh, it might have you wondering if I'm some sort of octopus, but apart from that, it's fine. You couldn't possibly object to this one, because as you all know, base, uh, objects are sort of the base uh, class of everything in the world. Um, but it was, would also be a very vague classification. I would also be greeting all the chairs in the room, right? And everything else. Uh, so I chose this one, and the purpose is to be a bit, little bit provocative and to start of us, uh, of us uh, at, uh, with a little bit of reflection, right? So I think apes is the, the most problematic of the alternatives that we've seen. And why is it problematic? Why, it's, why, why is it so dissonant? Is it because it's wrong? Well, I could say something completely wrong. I could say, hello, fellow grapes, instead. But that would be sort of absurd, right? So it wouldn't be problematic. And I guess we first need to settle this. Do we agree that we are apes? And to answer that, we sort of need to consider, well, what does it mean to be an ape? Or perhaps uh, more particular, what does it mean to belong to the category of apes? Now, technically, apes form a clade uh, of animals with a common ancestors. This, is, this approach to classification is known as cladistics, and it's how we currently categorize species in the animal kingdom. And from that perspective, well, there is no doubt, right? We know what a human is, and we know what this common ancestor is that forms the, the clade of ape. And in that perspective, there is no, there is no discussion. There is, an, is a relationship between it, and there's nothing more to discuss. So this is us now, uh, a good company at the family reunion with our fellow apes, and we should be enjoying ourselves. Uh, and if we're not enjoying ourselves, we're sort of flanked on the side here by a gibbon, so it's not that easy to sort of sneak out and go somewhere else. Um, not only are we apes, we are by far the most common ape on the planet. This number here, or this ratio, is the ratio uh, between uh, chimpanzees and humans in the world, by the highest number of esti uh, estimated number for the number of chimpanzees, which is 300,000. And for every one of those chimpanzees, there are 26,000 of us. So it's not even a competition. Almost every ape is a human. So if you take all the apes in the world and pick one at random, chances are you'll pick a human almost any time. So from that perspective now, a human is just a hominid in the category of simians, and there shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> but of course, there is a problem. And the problem, I think, has to do with typicality. Yes, we are the most common ape, but we don't think of ourselves as a typical ape. Which is actually kind of strange and a bit unusual, because usually, uh, when we talk about categories, very typical members tend to count, uh, um, or sorry, very common uh, um, examples tend to count as very typical as well. But it's not entirely unique. You have the same phenomenon for birds. Um, the most common bird in the world is the chicken which is kind of a pathetic bird. It can't even sort of fly properly, right? Um, but of course, we know what happened with the chicken. The reason that there are so many chickens in the world is that there are so many humans in the world. And we like to eat chickens, so we raise a lot of them. So we, we sort of broke the bird category as well. Whoops. Um, <laughs> so we are technically apes, but, right? So we've seen sort of the family photo. We didn't quite like it, but we sort of grudgingly accept that it is the fact that we are sort of technically in this category of apes, but we don't feel much like we belong, right? So we don't usually think of ourselves as apes. In fact, we primarily think of ourselves as human. And we can provide some reasons and some evidence why it's reasonable that we think of ourselves as human and not, uh, not as apes. For instance, we are not nearly hairy enough. Right? We have some bodily hair, but most apes, the way we think about them, have a lot more hair on their bodies than we do. Uh, we walk upright. so like this, right? Uh, we walk on two feet, whereas, well, all the apes that I know of tend to prefer to walk on all fours. Our arms aren't long enough. We have weak foot grip. We are poor climbers. This has something to do with walking upright, right? But it's, um, so it's much better suited to a life on the ground than up in the trees, right? Um, it's very hard, um, so, and a lot of us are even afraid of heights, right? Um, it's very hard to imagine something like an orangutan being afraid of heights. It would be very limiting for the orangutan uh, sort of lifestyle if you were afraid of heights as an or orangutan. 
And finally, we are much too intelligent to be mere apes. And this is probably the most problematic part. And we have even labeled ourselves, not too modestly, I guess, as the wise one, right? Homo sapiens. And finally, there's this one. Um, we're not quite fond enough of bananas. Most of us enjoy a banana. A few of us enjoy two in a row. No one eats three. But this is practically my vision of what an ape or a chimpanzee or a gorilla do is basically that they chain eat bananas all day. This is my picture of sort of ape behavior. Now this turns out to be wrong, and it, and it is true that bananas distinguish, uh, distinguish humans from, from the rest of the apes, uh, but the distinction is that we eat much more of them. In fact, when we talk about bananas, we usually mean this, and this is, um, this is actually the berry of the cultivated banana known as the Cavendish banana, and it is a domest domesticated plant. It can't repro uh, reproduce, so we need to clone them which means that it forms a very category, a interesting category in its own right, because all the sort of things are in some sense the same thing. And the only way that the other apes can get one of these is through us. So we are sort of like the banana dealers of the ape world. So we ended up here, but still, we are different. Right? We feel that we are different, and we feel that there are so many differences that this label of ape is poor fit for us. And our friend uh, Witt Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher, agrees, and he is a very smart ape, right? <laughs> so we should listen to him. And according to Wittgenstein, the meaning of a word is in the way it's used, right? And we don't use the label ape to refer to us, uh, ourselves. If we ever uh, refer to a human as an ape, that's an insult. It's a slur, right? We shouldn't do that. And I should apologize for greeting you as, as apes. So it seems to me that there is something going on here. There is an, a different notion of ape out uh, here as well, which is this sort of casual notion of ape. It's informal, and in that category, we don't really fit. Now, this is very confusing, right? So are we apes or are we not? seems to be sort of, yes, we are technically apes, but in practice or, or in everyday life, we're not apes, uh, and it doesn't feel like our identity. So what's the sort of the truth here? Now, it's not really that difficult, I think. Uh, it's just that we have to do, deal with sort of two different contexts. Right? And we refer um, to these uh, two different distinct categories of ape, using ape as a homonym. Right? And we get confused because we have those two categories sort of um, or those two contexts are playing at the same time. But we're still confused, right? Uh, and the reason is that usually we don't, we don't have this idea of context going on in our heads. And in fact, if we do, if we do become aware that, yes, well, there's, there's a problem with the way that we uh, have our everyday notion of ape and the technical uh, notion of ape, uh, we tend to rank them. So we believe somehow that the technical one is correct and the other one is really wrong. But it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, we might ask ourselves, well, just how ape are we? Now, if everything goes uh, right and you are a polite audience, at the end of this session, you might clap. Which seems to me is like the perfect example of sort of like this human ape-like behavior, because it seems very ape-like to me to sort of bang your hands together to make noise. <laughs> and other apes do this as well, but they don't do it for the same reason that humans do. They do it to sort of warn of danger or something like that, whereas humans are particularly social apes. So we have, in fact, invented um, sort of the technology of applause to signify the group's uh, acknowledgement of the individual. So this is a, a purely human ape invention and it sort of captures the fact that we are both human and ape at the same time, I think. Okay, so that was the introduction. Um, where are we now? I think we should look a little bit, uh, let's sort of get more technical, if you like. Uh, what is a category? And what does a question like that really mean? It's an interesting question, but what do, we, what, what do you sort of mean by that? And one perspective is that you might wonder, well, what is it really? Sort of what is the, in the, the ID world, what is, what, what, is the sort of, what is the true nature of categories? And this seems to me to be a very impractical perspective, 
because we cannot possibly know. And it's not even, it's not even certain that there is such a thing as a true nature of categories. Seems to me like uh, contemplating the true nature of sort of like celestial beings or something like that. So it's better, I think, to try to adopt some practi more practical perspectives. And we can do that. Uh, one interesting question that we might uh, wonder about is how is a category represented in the human brain? Now, of course, the answer to that question is also we don't really know, but we have some models. And the nice things and neat thing about models is that you can test them. You can run experiments and see how well they seem to hold up. Um, so we can test ourselves and see if the sort of the results that we get match the predictions that the models give us. Now, uh, the most common model and the so is the so-called classical model, which is based on this notion of essential properties. This is what we had in the folk theory for uh, class uh, categorization. And really, in, at least in Western thinking, this was the only model we had uh, up for at least 2,000 years, up until like the 70s, something like that. Um, maybe something starting in the 60s, something like the 70s, yes. Um, and our friend Wittgenstein had this example of the category of games, which is a category that is very hard to come up with uh, sufficient and necessary properties sort of to, class, to, to qualify unambiguously in the category of games. And then in the 70s, uh, a researcher called uh, Eleanor Roche did some experiments that fit really poorly with this notion of uh, essential properties. Now, in the classical view, there is no distinction uh, between sort of good members and bad members of a category. You either are a member or you're not. And that doesn't really fit with this notion of necessary and sufficient properties. So it shouldn't be harder to classify some objects than others. And she ran some experiment, uh, different kinds of experiments. Um, one thing that we, she ran an experiment uh, with was the, the color red, right? Classify colors as being red or not red. And this is very easy in some cases. Some, some colors are obviously blatantly red, but then in some cases like maroon or whatever, it gets harder. Is it red or is it not? And there seem to be these gradients going on. And the idea, um, or so, uh, the alternative model that uh, Eleanor Roche proposed was the prototype model. And the idea there is that there are these, there are these typical, prototypical uh, examples that are sort of form the center of the category. And then there are sort of, as you move further, along, uh, further away from that prototype, it gets sort of, the membership g gets weaker until at some point you're no longer a member of the category. And that sort of fits better with this notion of, well, some things are harder to classify. Another interesting question might be, what are categories used for? Why are they useful? Now, we need, uh, we use categories as a tool for sense making, uh, and we couldn't do very well without them. Uh, it's, it's, how, it's basically how we organize and structure information about the world, which is really important because we find ourselves situated in this world, right? And we are here, we are sort of trapped in the world, and we can't ins escape the world until that's, uh, at some point, we actually do. But um, while we're here, we need these categories to organize and structure information to make our life easier. And we do that through this continuous process of going like, well, this is like that, and this is identical to that. This is roughly the same. I can treat that the same. This is different from that, so I should treat that differently, and so on and so forth. Continuous process of sort of comparison and sorting and classification and distinguishing. And this is what enables language. It's very important that we do this because if, if everything were these individual ungrouped objects, they'd need unique names. So we'd need to sort of put the GUID on everything in the world and statements would be very boring. Very, very useless kind of language if you can't sort of talk about groups of objects in a sense. And it also allows for economy of thought, I can make sort of, I can think of whole groups of objects at the same time. And it allows for sort of sweeping statements about groups of things in the world. I can say things like all dogs are good, which conveys a lot of information, right? And it also enables induction, right? So if I experiment, uh, have an experience with some member of a group, I can infer that it's likely that will, it will also reproduce with another, uh, another member of the same category. Uh, for instance, if I, if I see um, a cat and a glass of water and the, sort of the cat seems to be pushing it off the table, 
next time I see a cat and a glass and a table, I'll be careful. Right? I learn from the behavior of cats. Yeah, so it enables learning. I don't have to have individual experiment, uh, experience with every object in the world. All doors work more or less the same. I can trust sort of the learning I have for doors to work to get into another building, even though I've never been there before. So it enables navigation, choice, planning, and meaningful action, and it sort of ultimately enables us to be effective agents in the world. We would be very helpless without these categories. Now, I'd like to, though so that was sort of a bit of theory, I'd like to talk about uh, categorization in practice. And a short story of it is that categorization in practice is hilarious. I think it's very, very amusing. And this is, this is why I've been spending so much time uh, looking into this stuff, because I think it's so funny. And I'd like to start with everyday casual modeling. And we'll see that that is kind of funny, uh, but it gets even funnier when we try to uh, get more technical. Now, this everyday modeling is sort of coarse and imprecise and partial, uh, but it's also mostly adequate. Uh, it's sort of uh, a lot of the time it works really, really well, and it's incredibly useful for the reasons that we just discussed. That we use them to achieve goals. Uh, but there is this quote by uh, Rebecca Versbrock uh, that I really like, um, which says, the longer you investigate something, the less coherent it becomes. And that really applies to categories. I, I lifted this quote out of its context, and you should never do that. It's very unfair to Rebecca. Uh, but I think it applies nicely to the topic of hand, even though it was stated in another context. Okay, so this notion of mem category membership, um, this is sort of the basic thing that we de do with categories is that we try to decide whether or not something fits into the category. So this is sort of a process now of membership evaluation. Um, and in the classical model, you have sort of uh, necessary and sufficient properties. If you have the right properties, you fit into the category. And that means that the sort of the membership el evaluation is just running a predicate on the object. Right? Is it this, or does it satisfy these demands? Well, then it is. right? And this helps us uh, establish sort of a, an ISA relationship. And this is very, very useful because um, it means that we can apply things like classical set theory and logic to these categories. Right? Because uh, sort of these categories now have crisp boundaries and there is no doubt of whether or not um, well, either you're in the category or you're not. And then you can sort of do deduction b based on that. So if it is a predicate, then sort of uh, the membership is a Boolean. It's true or false. Whereas in the prototype model, it's more like a rating, right? So if, you're if, you're, if you are the prototype, the prototypical thing, you can say that, well, the value is one. But then as you sort of move further along from the uh, prototype uh, away, uh, then you, at some point, are no longer a member of the category. And I, you can sort of, uh, we can have debates on what that number is, so maybe it's 0.5 or 0.4 or something like that, and you're no longer a member. OK, so let's try some examples. Now, as I said, it's mostly adequate. So sometimes this is really, really easy. Uh, for instance, we might wonder if this is a horse. In this case, I'm going to say with very high confidence that, yes, I believe that this is a horse. The horseness is incredibly high. <coughs> Uh, but let's try some other examples. What about this one? Is this a horse? Now, if, if I were a child and I pointed to this thing and said horse, my mother and father would say, no, no, it's not a horse. Uh, it's a capybara, it's a different kind of animal. Um, so the horseness is quite low. But, but in a sense, it's not all bad. This is still a mammal. It's roughly the same size. It's smaller than a horse, but it's uh, but roughly the same size. Um, it has four legs and so on and so forth. What about this one? Is this a horse? Well, the horseness is even lower in this case, uh, but it's still roughly the same size. It has some of the same properties, if you like. Maybe not all of them, but it has some properties. Four legs. What about this? I think it's practically zero. Let's hope it's not horse. Uh, it's probably chicken, right? <laughs> it's probably chicken. Uh, but sometimes, so these were kind of 
easy cases. Sometimes it's a little bit harder. What about this one? Is this a horse? I'm going to rate it at like medium plus. So it's, it's quite horse-like. Uh, has a lot of the same properties. It looks quite a bit like a horse. Mm. In fact, you might wonder, why is, it, why is it not high? Why is this not a horse? I read it medium plus. To me, there is no real difference between this animal and a horse. Right? For all I care, and for everything I've done in my life so far, this could have been a horse, and I would have done nothing different. Now, the thing is, categories are not independent. Right? The hoarseness, if you like, depends on the existence or absence of other categories. So what's happening now is not that this is a poor horse. It's the problem is that the donkeyness sort of sabotages for the hoarseness of the donkey. <laughs> right? Without sort of this pestering category of being a donkey, this, would be in, uh, this one have, would have been a perfectly fine horse. But because we have the category of donkeys, we need to rate it as, as a, a donkey instead, and, and sort of the hoarseness rating drops. And this is actually a phenomenon that neither the classical uh, model nor the prototype model sort of accounts for. And there are some other models. We're not going to discuss those, but this is very interesting. There is a relationship between different categories. So, OK, let's try another. Now, when you're discussing categories, you sort of have to talk about this, right? And the reason you have to talk about this is because, oh, God, it's so hard, right? It's, it's the hardest problem in the world. Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? This is impossible. And you know, um, you might remember, well, it's the opposite that I'm supposed to think. That's the right answer, right? So I, I should, well, I think, oh, yeah, very, very hard. <sighs> but it's sort of, I think, <laughs> this is the wrong question again. To me, if you ask me, this thing, the tomato, is 70% vegetable and 30% fruit. Right? And you cannot really convince me otherwise. Right? It's, it's, not, it's definitely not the ideal fruit. It's not maybe the ideal vegetable either. Uh, but this is sort of my everyday casual categorization. And I don't really need to choose. I am never in the situation where it's important to me whether or not this is a fruit. I only care that this is a tomato. All the time. So in a sense, it's Schrodinger's tomato, right? So outside a given context, <laughs> I don't have to make a choice. It can be sort of superimposed in both the fruit and the vegetable category. And most of the time, I never need to make a choice. Now, my friend Rameau had this uh, beautiful um, quote. He said that in the culinary context, if you're making food, if you're in the kitchen, then tomato is a vegetable. If you're a botanist, it's a fruit. Uh, that's the sort of the technical category of fruits that sort of sees the tomato. And if you're doing theater, the tomato is feedback. <laughs> and it struck me as I was preparing that, this talk that this probably also applies uh, for talks at conferences. Right, so this means that now at the end of the session, you have a choice. You can either clap your hands or you can throw a tomato. And then you can sort of uh, think for yourself which one of those behaviors are more ape-like. <laughs> so the point uh, here is that these categories are, are not sort of universal. They are contextual, and they can be fussy. And there are degrees of membership. And these are all sort of terrible problems for the folk theory of categorization. Now, here's another example. This is uh, a thing that people get sort of... Uh, heated debates uh, about is chess a sport. Right? And you can go online and you can find discussions, people um, arguing one way or the other. Now, if you ask people, a bunch of people, um, whether or not chess is a sport, on average, they will say that, well, chess belongs to the kind of sport that is also a game, which is interesting. This is, again, this is uh, uh, averages. Right? So on average, people will say that it qualifies as a sport that's also a game. And they will also, on average, say, no, it's not a sport. Which means now, again, that, that sort of classical logic is broken. Right? We cannot, obviously, we can't be trusted to do these categorizations. 
Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about relations between categories. We, we talked about the horse, horses and the donkeys. We like to uh, structure our categories in text taxonomies. We like to form hierarchies because it, it, it uh, makes the world neater. There is very little evidence that inside our heads we have represented these hierarchies. So we sort of superimpose them from the outside, but we, we still find them incredibly useful. And this is sort of known territory for programmers because we like to think in terms of generalization and specializations. This here is um, how, sort of our model for categorizing animals in the animal kingdom. But this, again, this is just a model. This is just an invention by people. This is something that we try to impose on the real world. We shouldn't take this too seriously. This is not, definitely not the first model we've had. There have been many models before it. There will be another model to sort of uh, replace this one when enough people doing research on animals decide that that's, that's the better thing to do. And in fact, as I was researching this talk, Google also helpfully said that people also ask about the seven classifications of animals and the five classifications of animals and the 10 classifications of animals and the six major classifications of animals, the 11 groups of animals and the seven characteristics of animals. We shouldn't take our models too seriously. So we use them because they're use we, we prefer them because they're useful. Now, what I find most interesting about hierarchies is the notion of basic level categories. Now, if you have a hierarchy, um, one level tends to be singled out or identified as the basic level category. And we use that basic level when we do categorization. Now, an example of a basic level category might be something like a dog. Right? This is the level that I will use to categorize. When I see an animal running toward me, my brain will quickly say, well, that's a dog. Right? And this basic level preference means that this happens much quicker. Right? If someone uh, asks me to use a different level for categorization than the basic level, I will be slower. Um, right? So we're much, much quicker at the basic level. The way this, uh, uh, this uh, sort of happens is through a process of difference and in information. And this is a very pragmatic process. It's, uh, sort of, it's not conscious, it's not something we do deliberately, but it happens inside our brain to economize uh, the categories that we have in our brains. We'd like sort of coarse-grained categories that convey a lot of information. Like uh, the category of dog conveys a lot of information. The category of cat also con conveys a lot of information. And the similar for bird and what have you. Now, something like uh, a German shepherd conveys even more information about the object. But if I were to use sort of the uh, the level below my basic level, there would be this uh, sort of explosion of categories. I would have to sort of think about, well, how is it related to a poodle? And, and a, sort of, uh, a poodle and a German Shepherd are different, but not that different, right? So I, I want to sort of maximize both the information I get and the difference between the categories. That's when it's most useful, and that's when I can sort of have the fewest, most powerful categories in my head. So this happens automatically. It's a feature of our brains. But again, it's not entirely um, universal. So it's based on utility and our experience. So it, it adapts over time to our context. It's based on our experience. I cannot decide which level is my basic level. It just happens. And it depends on my exp uh, expertise and my knowledge. So if I, if I was raising dogs, maybe I would sort of think about dogs so much and it would be so useful to me that sort of my basic level preference would be pushed down. Maybe I would start classifying quicker and actually say poodle or German shepherd or whatever kinds of dogs there are. And since it's based on utility and experience, it's also ultimately culture specific. Now, as an urban dweller, I have very coarse grained sort of categories for things in nature. For instance, I, I, I took a picture of this beautiful tree. I have no idea what kind of tree this is. I just think it's beautiful. I will recognize some trees, but again, my basic level preference is just tree. So if you show me uh, like a birch that I know technically is a birch, I will say it's a tree before I think it's a birch. Right. Now, if I lived in the forest, it might have been different. Again, my basic level preference might have been pushed down. But um, 
with categories, it's always more complicated. Right? So it's almost, this is sort of the basic th uh, stuff. Let's, um, let's see how it can get more complicated. And what I'd like to do is run a little bit ex experiment to see if we can uncover some of that complexities. And I need your participation for this. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a couple of pictures. And I'd like you to categorize what you see in that picture as quickly as possible. And this is very, very easy for you because your brains are super good at this. Right? This is, I want millisecond responses. I don't want any of the sort of, you know, about um, uh, thinking fast and slow. This is fast. Right? I want you to operate in fast mode. We're going to run a little test first to see if we should, well, to see if I get some noise. That's one thing. Uh, and to see that it sort of works. So let's try this one. Countdown, three, two, one, and... A horse. horse. Excellent. This is a horse. This is the horse that we saw before with the very high hoarseness. This worked beautifully. So let's try the actual experiment. I'm going to show you two more pictures, and we're going to do exactly the same. So here's picture one. Countdown, three, two, and... Bird. Bird. Excellent. Looks like a bird to me as well. Let's try the second picture. And we have another countdown. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> what the hell just happened? <laughs> this is a very simple hierarchy, right? Both robins and penguins are birds. and. Still, at the same time, we tend to categorize robins as birds and penguins as penguins. And that's, that's very strange. And it doesn't fit the basic level preference, right? So our basic level is the bird, but it didn't apply to the penguin. Now, what's one way to understand this, in a sense, is that a robin is a bird that happens to be a robin. It's like a detail. Whereas a penguin is a penguin that happens to be a bird, which is very different. And that's a convoluted way of saying that robins are typical birds. And penguins are atypical birds. Uh, and when we have an atypical member, something that we like to call edge cases sometimes, um, we think that we miss something important about the thing if we classify them as birds. Right? Our brains are not satisfied, uh, satisfied by classifying them as birds. And this is not a conscious decision. It just happens in our brains. Right? And this is, has, actually has a lot of interesting uh, consequences. For instance, if, um, if you have a disease that affects robins, we tend to generalize that this probably affects all birds. If it, if it is a disease that affects uh, penguins, we tend to think this is probably a penguin-specific thing. We shouldn't be too hasty about generalizing. So typical cases are categorized at the basic level, uh, atypical cases at the sort of subordinate level. So hierarchies are fun. Uh, there is some more uh, trouble in taxonomy town. Um, one thing is um, transitivity. As again, if the folk theory were right, and something is a member of one category, and that thing is a member of another car category, uh, then you sort of had transitivity between that. So you have categories A, B, and C. Everything in A is a B as well. And everything in B is a C. This is inheritance, if you like. Then it follows that everything in A also belongs in C. So this is, this is transitivity. Um, Non-transitivity means that this doesn't hold. Now what we have here, uh, this is a chair. On average, do we count chair as furniture? Do we think that chairs are furniture? Yes. People tend to agree that, yes, chairs are, in fact, furniture. Uh, what about this? Is a car seat a chair? Yes. On average, again, most people will say yes. Now, if you ask people if car seats are furniture, they're going to say no. So we don't have tra transitivity here. Um, and it's easy to think now that, well, sort of car seat is a chair, that's the problematic part. But we still agree that it is a chair, but yet it's not furniture. So there's something more going on. It's not just that sort of the weak membership uh, of car seats in chair that is the problem, but it's the combination of those things. 
So categories are fuzzy. There are degrees of membership. Some members are more typical than others. And there are edge cases um, that are sort of um, the rebels in the category world. They don't want to, uh, they sort of reject the structures that we try to impose on them. Right? And these are the objects where it's not so clear what the membership really is. Mm. And because of that, this leads to discussion sometimes. We negotiate over what a category is. And I, I tried to Google negotiation, but all you got were these boring pictures of people shaking hands. And, and that's not really what negotiation is. So I, I think this sort of <laughs> captures it more nicely. <laughs> now, an example of a discussion that you might tumble into. Um, you can enter this discussion at will anytime online. Um, this is like a classical discussion in software. Is HTML a programming language? And I'm sure there are people in this room also. We're not going to talk about that. But there are people in this room who have strong opinions about it. I'm, I'm absolutely sure about that. Um, this, it seems like almost like a philosophical question. To the extent it is, I think it's like the least, probably the most boring philosophical question in the world. Um, <laughs> And the reason is that it's not really a philosophical question, it's a political question. The real question is, do we want HTML to be a part of the programming language category or not? That's a choice. That's up to us to decide. But we tend to sort of confuse descriptive and normative when you talk about stuff like that. We say things like, HTML is not a real programming language. And we mean that to be descriptive, but it's actually a normative statement. We're really saying, I don't want it in there. I don't think it belongs, so I want it out of the category. Um, it's actually very interesting that we apply this, this sort of adjective as a real, right? Well, it might be in the category, but it's not really in the category. And we do that to try to exclude the edge cases. The problem is not the object, it's always the category that is the problem. The object is just what it is. And our friend the platypus wholeheartedly agrees. <laughs> the platypus is uh, a mammal who lay, uh, that lay, uh, lays eggs, and that's unusual in the world. But it's completely natural to the platypus. It couldn't be any other way. The problem is just with our categories. Now, we shouldn't take this, you know, uh, we shouldn't be sort of too naive about this, right? Uh, this, because this, uh, discussions about categories can be proxy discussions for something else. Now, for instance, this, the discussion whether or not HTML is a programming language also decides who is a programmer. If you do HTML, are you a real programmer? And this can has, uh, have some real consequences in, in the form of recognition and uh, how much you get paid for your work, and so on and so forth. So it's an important decision. And sort of being able to define what a category means means exercising some sort of power over the domain. Right? It gives you power. So a question like, is X a member of Y, sounds very objective, but it's really not in many cases. And what we should be asking ourselves when we have questions like this is, what are the implications of including x in y? Right. What are the pros and cons of having x as a member of the y categories? And there will be trade-offs for that. And with those trade-offs, we're really doing modeling. So now we're coming, to, um, coming closer to how this applies to software. Now, I like to think of modeling as technification of categories, because we are now in a specific, uh, specific context, and so we need more technical categories. Um, and one thing that we like, uh, typically want to do then is to eliminate some of this ambiguity. We need to handle the edge cases. <laughs> right? They are not much trouble in everyday life. In fact, it's, sort of, it's a benefit. Um, ambiguity is a benefit for everyday life, because we can get by with very coarse-grained categories in many cases. Now, technification of categories can have some surprising consequences. We've seen some of them already, but there are many, many more. Turns out that nuts are fruits. Almonds are not nuts. There are many more. Um, strawberries, store, strawberries are not berries. Eggplants are. So we're wrong about everything. All our categories are broken. But again, we're not wrong, right? Um, we've seen this before. We've been through this before with the apes. 
So the problem, what's missing, is the context. And there's this tension between everyday categories um, and technical categories. Everyday categories, ambiguity is fine. Technical categories, we want to eliminate it. So we use technical categories for precision. It's very important to remember that they are no longer exactly the same categories. They just share the same names, and that leads to confusion. Now, this precision comes at a cost. Now, I talked about uh, that I work at the Norwegian Labor and Welfare Administration, and we have a lot of categories. A lot of them we don't define ourselves. They're defined in Norwegian law. So I'd like to sort of uh, run you through variations on the theme here uh, from Nob. This is actually one of our legal coaches who sort of uh, gathered together these, uh, this um, collection of uh, uh, related categories. And the, the theme we're going to talk about is unmarried people who live together. And this seems like an unproblematic, uh, unambiguous category, right? Here are some variations on that theme. Two people above 18 years of age who are not married, registered partner, or living with anyone else. Two people who usually live together, even though they are temporarily separated. Two people living together in the same house, even if they live in separate parts of the house, unless they each live in separate units in a house with four or more independent and clearly separated units. Two people who have previously been married, who are living together in a marriage-like relationship, who could legally get married or enter partnership, who have or are expecting children together, who have or have had children together, who live in a joint residence, who live in a common household, who have lived together for at least 12 months, who have lived together for 12 of the last 18 months, two people who intend to keep living together. So this precision comes at a cost, and this cost, in this case, is an explosion of almost identical uh, categories with a lot, uh, with a lot of well, a lot of overlap, but not completely. Right? And you might argue <coughs> that what, well, so we have this explosion of similar categories, and you might argue uh, your gut reaction might be, well, Norwegian law needs to be simplified, and you might be right uh, about that, right? Uh, maybe it seems like it's ridiculously complicated for no apparent reason. At the same time, we want these uh, services we provide uh, to be provided as fairly as possible. Right? And there will be negotiations over what that means. Um, and changing some of these categories could have profound uh, effects on the precision of who gets what, under what circumstances. So the point here is that we need to choose it's not that something is right or wrong. Choices are never right or wrong. Choices just have consequences. So we should try to choose in a way that has the consequences that we like. And for that, we need to make decisions. Now, to sort of uh, to finish this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about the impact of making decisions. Right? And we, when we make decisions, we make them on, based on some implicit model of the world with a lot of categories and all that stuff, and also implicit op opinions about what matters and what does not matter. And we have tacit assumptions that underlie the decisions that we make. Now, any time you have an assumption, you have a bet against the future. Right? And, and in a sense that your assumption might be invalidated at some later point. And the biggest pro unsolved problem in software development and in modeling is the passing of time. Because the passing of time will in, uh, invalidate some of our assumptions. And it's even worse because assumptions and decisions accumulate over time. Um, so we're, and we're sort of weighed down by the accumulated assumptions that we've made. This is from a Norwegian TV show called Mestanus Mester where former athletes compete against each other, and this is called gravity. Uh, and the way it works is that each athlete works this, walks these rounds, and for each round, you can think of it as a sprint, they pick, up, they pick up a bag of sand, and it gets a little heavier every time you make a round. And some, uh, sometimes software development feels a little bit like that. We, talk, we tend to call it technical debt. But it's really, I think, often just the sort of inevitable byproduct of change in time and inertia uh, in the sense of that we have built a lot of stuff on top of these assumptions and decisions that we've made. So when we may want to make a change, it's going to have some sort of impact. We might get asked questions like, well, how, does, how long does this feature take to implement? And to answer that, we need to consider things like, well, well how does this feature change our mental model now? How many assumptions are invalidated by this new feature? How many decisions have you made that must be undone and remade in a different way? 
And in particular, how much structure relies on these invalidated assumptions? How much structure have we built on decisions that are now obsolete? And it's very easy to think of sort of like technical debt and the technical structure in form of, sort of like code that we've built, but it also applies to things like organizational structure. We're organized in a particular way because we, we think the world works in a particular way, sort of optimized uh, to fit with the assumptions that have been uh, valid so far. And organizational structure also means economic structure. And economic structure also means power structure. So moving these things can be pretty difficult. And they're not sort of independent structures either. It is intertwined, mutually reinforcing structures. Uh, we have this phenomenon in Conway's law, but it applies basically, I think, to all kinds of structure that are sort of interwoven. And this can lead to entrenchment and ossification, and things get hard and brittle. Uh, sometimes I like to compare doing software development to the game of Tetris. Um, and the way it is sort of it play, it is, uh, unfolds like this. We make some sort of assumption which reduces our degrees of freedom in going forward. We have some indecision that also in turn, and we build some structure anyway, and that also reduces our degrees of freedom. We generalize a little bit, that reduces our degree of freedom because it's a bet against the future that we will stay general that way. Uh, we have some ambiguity that we could, weren't able to resolve in time, so we just went al uh, along and, and sort of built something anyway. We have some misunderstanding. There's a conflict, and it's game over. And now, well, the colors are kind of weird, but still. Um, the question with Tetris is never how do I win, because you can't win at Tetris, you can only lose. The question is how do we play well? And I think modeling is our best bet, because um, it reduces the amount of unnecessary assumptions that we need to make. And modeling then as sort of the deliberate design of these technical categories, where we don't do this blindly, but we're very careful about the implication of including or, or excluding something from a category. Now, modeling, of course, is very difficult. And I like to think of modeling as a sort of metaprogramming at the same time as you're programming, because you're changing the concepts that you use to think about something while you're thinking about that something. And this can lead to discomfort. And we don't like to do it very much. We're not very flexible about that. It can be sort of painful to think that way because you don't have the right concepts yet. And for that reason, we might get some reluctance and some resistance if you ask someone to participate and help you model the problem. Sometimes people will say things like, why are you making things so, so difficult or so complicated? Right? And this is when you bring up stuff like categories and memberships and edge cases. What about this edge case? What, what, what should we do about it? Why are you making it so complicated? And of course, the real answer to that is to avoid making it unnecessarily complicated over time. And I think modeling is teachable. Um, and one way we can start is to learn more about categories and not be naive about these processes and not uh, take our models too seriously because they're just sort of choices that we made. Uh, I'd like to finish off with some recommendations, uh, some books to read that I've enjoyed a lot. Uh, one is The Big Book of Concepts by Gregory Murphy. Uh, another good one that talks a lot about the work of Eleanor Roche is Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things by George Lakoff. Um, and finally, Sorting Things Out by uh, Bowker and Starr. This is also... This is, really talks about classification, but the distinction be between classification and category is... Yeah, well, it's fussy to say the least. Okay, we're practically done. I just want to leave you with one final example. This is this uh, news article that says that bees are now officially a type of fish in California. Now, what I really hope is that at the end of this talk, your reaction is not, this is complete nuts, uh, what have they been smoking in California, and so on and so forth. What you should be thinking is, I really wonder what the context is that makes this a reasonable thing to do, right? Thank you. <laughs>